What's up, Substance? Today is the last day in our current teaching series called At The Movies, where we are showing clips from popular movies and teaching how we can discover more about God and what He has for our lives right there in those movies. Because of copyright issues, we are legally not allowed to post them, so this series has been in-person only. However, we wanted to make sure that those who aren't able to make it in person had a word of encouragement today. We just finished up our marriage, relationship, and parenting series called First Comes Love. So we thought it would be great to follow it up with Pastor Peter's series called Fight Night, which goes hand in hand with all things relationships. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this message. What is up, Substance? Make some noise wherever you are at. You made it to church. Look at you guys. Wow, you clean up and everything. I love you guys. If we haven't met yet, uh, I'm Pastor Peter Haas, and of course, we are in week four of our teaching series called Fight Night. And, and if you don't know what this whole series is about, well, basically, it, it's quite simple. We're, we've been talking about how to go through conflict in a way that is life-giving, that is biblical, that is skillful. Uh, but before we dive into our Bible text today, I just want to quickly give a shout out for all of the volunteers who made this last week happen. Many of you guys know that we, uh, we pulled off one of our largest pastors' conferences ever, uh, the GROW Conference here, this last week at our Northtown campus. And in case you didn't know, I mean, literally, I mean, we have a lot of pastors that will fly in any given week. We could have a couple pastors visiting Substance from somewhere around the world. But uh, we literally had hundreds of pastors flying in uh, to be a part of this conference. And uh, every last one of them, when I would host them, they would say, where did you get your volunteers from? I mean, you have the most joyful, I mean, in the parking lot, where, who are these people? I, you know, like even the pastors down south, they're like, even when it's sunshiny, I can't get my parking volunteers to be happy. <laughs> but you guys, they're jumping all over the place. I, you know, I didn't have the heart to tell them. It's because they're so cold. Um, no, but actually, it, no, it's because you guys genuinely are joyful, and then the greeters, and then the coffee, I mean, they, everybody was like, and your staff, they, I mean, their hospitality and attention to detail is over the top, and I, they were just bragging you guys up, and so just, uh, I, I, in fact, Pastor Chris Hodges, who's kind of a big deal, he said this was the smoothest event they've ever uh they've ever done outside of their own church, Church of the Highlands in the South. So can I, we just give it up for all of our volunteers, West Side, downtown, you guys make this place such a delightful place to serve. And I, I just have this sense that God is going to do something big in us and through us in this coming season. So anyway, hats off to all of you guys. Now about Two decades ago, many of you guys know that uh, before pastoring Substance, I, I pastored in Wisconsin for better half of about nine years. And um, I'll never forget, there was this one tragedy shortly after I became the lead pastor there. There was this tragedy in the church where uh, my wife and I were literally woken up Sunday morning by the police. When you get a call from the police uh, Sunday morning, it's usually not good. And uh, two, two really well-known members of our church, two young men, were killed by a drunk driver in an accident the night before. And they needed either me or my wife to be there when they told the family. And so the family didn't even know. And so, of course, I have to preach. So I, I'm like, so Carolyn kind of got thrust into the job of going with the police. And then I was going to preach. Uh, she was going to call me the moment they, that they had announced the family because I knew that I'm going to have to tell the church at some point because, you know, this is, again, before social media. Uh, we're going to have to spread the word somehow. And, and then I'm going to have to go out and join the, my wife and the family. And it was just one of those awful, awful, awful situations. And so, of course, you know, the moment I got the phone call, you know, I didn't, I didn't even have time to eat breakfast because I had to go have emergency meetings at the church. I didn't have time to eat lunch. And then when I'm driving out to their house in the middle of nowhere, uh, there's no restaurants out there. I knew that I wasn't going to get to eat dinner either. And so, you know, out of desperation, I did what the only thing I could do, and that's stop by the gas station and eat one of those gas station hot dogs. <laughs> and I, I know, I know, right? I didn't want to eat it, but I, this is this extreme times, 
you have to resort to extreme measures. So I'm going to eat some gas station hot dogs. And, uh, and so, you know, I, I, I got my buns ready. I put them in the little bun box, you know what I'm saying? And, and I'm kind of an artiste. And so, you know, it takes me a little time to, you know, because there's nothing like having the wrong amount of ketchup on your hot dog, right? And so I'm like, I'm painting it on just right. I'm doing the mustard. And, and I'm doing it on several buns at the same time in these little bun baskets. Okay, so again, I'm an artist. So I, I just, I, and then all of a sudden I became aware somebody was standing behind me waiting to get to the hot dogs as well. And I realized, oh, I'm being rude. I've like literally occupied the entire hot dog art station. And, uh, and, and so I'm like, I turned to him and I'm like, oh, why don't you go ahead of me? I'll go get my drink because um, I'm going to take a while. And, and so then I, I go get my drink. Well, while I went to get my drink, they took every last hot dog off the hot dog burner. Like with my buns sitting right there. I was being nice to them, letting them go ahead of me, and they took ever. I mean, I was mad. I mean, wh why? Who, who are these people? You know what I'm saying? It was like, and then, and then they were walking up to the register with all of the hot dogs, and I, and I, I literally wanted to confront them. I literally started walking towards them, like, like I was going to do it, like you wiener snatcher, you know, like what? And then I, I kept thinking about everything I might say, and I'm like, this is not going to come out right, Peter. This is not good. You're a pastor. And, and I, I'm just like, like, how do you confront someone like that? Like, you, you took my hot dogs. You know what I'm saying? And, and I, I just, whew, I remember taking a deep breath, and I had to throw all my buns away that were so artistically decorated, grabbed a bag of chips, and went on. You know what I'm saying? Now, Years later, after lots of counseling, after lo I've made peace with the great hot dog snatcher of central Wisconsin. And I, I, and, and I, but I got to be honest with you, there are other circumstances I've experienced in my life that have taken me a lot longer to forgive someone, okay? I know that's kind of a silly story, but uh, I think that in this life, people are going to do things to you at some point or another that are going to catch you off guard. And some of those wounds are going to last longer than you expected. They're going to linger longer. What do you do with those wounds, with that baggage when that happens? And I think all of us are going to experience the, the problem of, of unforgiveness lurking around in our souls at some point or another. And, I, and, and here's how, some of you, you're like, well, I don't struggle with unforgiveness. I, I, this is not a message for me. Well, how do you know? Well, is there, let me ask you this. Is there anyone in your life who you are tempted to rehearse their failures? Is there anyone in your life who you are tempted to rehearse their failures? Rehearsing people's failures is the classic sign of unforgiveness. When we feel tempted to rehearse someone's, favor, uh, someone's failures, and it may not be a who, it might be a what, like an institution. Rehashing pain in our lives is usually a sign of unforgiveness. And you have to understand, unforgiveness is such a sneaky little thing. It creeps into your life. Sometimes it wasn't even you that was victimized. It was your friend, and your, you caught their unforgiveness. You caught their offense. It can sneak into your life even through other people. You see, that's how sneaky it is. Well, and, and so then people are like, a lot of times when I say that, they're like, well, gosh, don't, then, then we all have unforgiveness, don't we, Peter? I mean, like, when, when do you know you've forgiven someone? Well, here's actually how you know. You know you've forgiven someone when you no longer feel the need to rehearse their sins. You just don't even feel the need to even worry about it. I think, but I, I say this because I think a lot more people struggle with unforgiveness than they realize. And unfortunately, if we don't learn how to deal with that kind of stuff, hurting people will hurt more people. Like I've always said here, pain that is not transformed is what? It's transmitted. You just keep perpetuating pain in other people's lives. And so to deal with this, this is what I want to do today, is I want to do a little spring cleaning. I want to make sure that your soul is free, filled with joy, filled with peace. And we're going to do it by studying a classic Bible passage about a guy named Joseph in the book of Genesis. 
Uh, of course, Joseph, it's kind of a famous story because he's, he's this young man who has, you know, his whole life ahead of him. He's got visions from God of all the things that God is going to use him for, and yet his brothers started getting jealous of him, and so that jealousy got to such a degree that they decided, you know what, let's actually take Joseph out. Let's kill him. Let's murder our own brother. How many of you know that's, that's something to be feel hurt about, right? Well, instead of murdering him, one of the brothers finally says, how about we do this instead? How about we throw him in a pit, sell him into slavery for the rest of his life? And that's exactly what they did. And, and then, of course, what, what makes the story of Joseph so awful is that as if that thing all by itself wasn't awful enough, he had awful thing after awful thing after awful thing happen over and over and over again. Even when he got out of slavery and things started going well for him, then he gets falsely accused of a crime he didn't commit. He gets thrown into prison again. And then even when he's about to get out of prison, he gets left and abandoned in prison for a whole longer period of his life. I mean, it's just so much pain going on in his life. It, just thing after thing after thing. And then Finally, through a crazy set of circumstances, Joseph has the opportunity to help the Pharaoh, the most powerful person in the world, and he was promoted from prisoner slave into being the second most powerful person on earth. Okay, so it's kind of a rags to riches story, and uh, it, it's kind of a, a, a he, Joseph is the poster child of bad things happening to good people. And of course, even though the story ends well, if you read the story, the whole latter half of the book of Genesis from like chapter 39 onward, you know, you, you see so much pain because you're like, God, why? why? Why did all these things have to happen to Joseph? And we're going to ask that question today after all of these years, the part where we're going to read that we're going to pick up in the story, after all of these years of pain, Joseph finally finds himself face to face with the very brothers who were going to kill him. And now he's got all the power in the world to now exact the revenge that he's been dreaming about for years. And so the question is, will he get the revenge he, he's wanted or, or should he even go through with it? Those types of questions. Should I, should I get payback? I mean, it had been so many years his brothers couldn't even recognize him. And so we pick up in Genesis chapter 45, verses 1 through 3. We get a, a little snapshot of the pain that Joseph had going on in his heart. And so in this moment, he's seeing his brothers. He's shaking with anger. And in verse 1, Joseph says to them, Joseph could no longer control himself before all of his attendants, right? So this is in front of an entire assembly of people they're meeting before, you know, again, because he's the second most powerful man on earth. And, and he could no longer control himself before all of his attendants. And he cried out, have everyone leave my presence. And so there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brother. So kind of a crazy moment. I mean, he's freaking out. All of his attendants are scurrying out of the room. And now it's just Joseph and his brothers in this room. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him and Pharaoh's household heard about it. So all of the attendants leave the room and yet he wept so loudly they could even hear him out of the room. They're all thinking, what is going on with the boss? Like why would he be, what, what could get him to the point where he would lose all self-control in front of a large group of people. I mean, they're, they're, I mean, the gossip went all the way through Pharaoh's household. And so, you know, after years of pain, here he is. He's becoming unhinged. After years of question, years of regret, years of hurt, it's just pouring out of his body. And maybe, church, maybe you're here today and you, you could relate to that. You know what I'm saying? Maybe, maybe your pain isn't quite as extreme as Joseph's, but maybe for you, you've got unmet expectations from your, your coworkers, your parents, your children, your friends, and, and, and those wounds, they linger with you. When you even when you try to worship, they, these, these memories come back into your heart and listen. Listen, um, in moments like these, 
Those are the moments I believe that you and I are, are tempted to turn to things like revenge, turn to things like payback, and, and really those are just the, the, the symptoms of a deeper issue called forgiveness. I, I think that's what unforgiveness is, is it's a healthy way of dealing with that pain. And so then it begs the question, well, why in the world do we do this? Like a lot of times when I find myself walking in unforgiveness, I have to stop myself and say, what, what, is the, what am I using unforgiveness to accomplish? What is it? in me that I'm trying to do. And I, 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 I've learned over the years that part of the reason why we use unforgiveness as a tool is because of certain misconceptions that we have in our hearts that I want to expose really fast today. I, I really believe that a lot of Christians have a lot of misconceptions about unforgiveness. And I, I see it a, a lot in our culture, right? Like my wife and I love like crime dramas. We love like police you know, police, like who done it, and those types of things. And I, part of it, I love, I love it when you know the good guys win in the end. You know what I'm saying? Because it's like it gives me a sense of justice in the world. But I, I just, you know, like it's it, when you watch enough of those those TV shows, you'll hear these myths of forgiveness all the time, okay? Like you'll hear these really silly things like forgive and forget, like they'll say in the episode, which is not even necessarily biblical. And I'm gonna expose some of these fallacies of forgiveness. And I, I think as I expose some of these misconceptions, some of you are gonna all of a sudden be like, oh, I get it. That's why the Bible teaches what it teaches, okay? And misconception number one, I'm gonna share it with you. We falsely think that forgiveness is a feeling and a moment instead of a choice and a process. We falsely think that forgiveness is a feeling and a moment when in reality it is a choice and a process. A lot of people, they wait for a feeling, an emotion to come upon them before they forgive. Well, let me tell you, if you're waiting for a feeling, it ain't gonna come. I'm just telling you, it's like, because it's not a feeling, okay? It, it, a lot of people, they think about forgiveness kind of like apologies. If you, you know, if you're going to make an apology, you got to make a sincere apology. Otherwise, it doesn't count, right? You've heard that. You remember that as a kid? You just make a fake one. I'm sorry. I'm sorry you're such an idiot. You know what I'm saying? Like, you... you <laughs> You didn't really apologize, so it doesn't really count, right? And so they think the same thing happens to work with forgiveness. But actually, that's not the way forgiveness works. It's not a moment. It doesn't, yeah, you may have forgiven someone once, but remember, it's a process. You have to, you, when you forgive someone, you're, you're actually committing to a process of forgiving them a hundred times or however many times it kind of reawakens in your heart. Okay, so it's a process, not a moment, and it's a, it, it's a choice, not a feeling, okay? So if, if you're waiting for a feeling, it's not going to happen. It'd be like this, okay? Imagine, uh, imagine you're loading up your cart at the grocery store. You don't ever ask yourself at the grocery store, do I feel like paying for all of this? <laughs> well, some of you do, and that's why you keep getting arrested, but I, I just... <laughs> You know what I'm saying? My, my point is, is there are times where you should not even ask yourself, how do I feel? You just do it. It's a choice, okay? In a similar way, I think a lot of people, they, they, they wait for their adversary to apologize first, and then they will apologize, right? But, but think about how silly that is. That'd be like saying, I refuse to live healthy until you live healthy first, there's a lot of people, they ain't ever going to get healthy. You know what I'm saying? How's that going to work out for you, right? It's like drinking poison and then waiting for it to affect the other person. See? Mmm. Why do I feel so terrible? Like even our, even our adversaries are like, you look awful. You know what I'm saying? Like it's not affecting them the way it's affecting us. You see, unforgiveness is drinking poison and then waiting for it to affect another person. Well, then why do we do it if it's so toxic for us? Well, a lot of people do it because they think unforgiveness is how they create boundaries or enable justice, okay? So just stick with me, okay? They think unforgiveness is how we enable boundaries or activate justice, but that leads us to misconception too. It's the false idea that forgiveness means overlooking healthy boundaries and minimizing sins. There's a lot of people that define forgiveness as pretending people didn't hurt us. Or, or minimizing sin. Well, they didn't mean to hurt me. No, uh, some of them did. And well, yeah, but I don't, I don't know if they intended to hurt. Well, they still hurt you even if they didn't intend it. As if somehow we have to minimize it in order to forgive. I don't believe either of those approaches are healthy or even biblical. Let me give you an example, okay? Uh, years ago, I had a friend who uh, his wife had an affair on him. 
and uh, really, really wounded him, but they made the decision to stay together as a couple. And of course, but neither of them ever really went through a process of healing. They never went to a marriage counselor after this experience. They never went through uh, like the diagnosis of how did they get there in the first place. They never really went through a process of healing. They just got back together. And of course, he felt guilty that he had this constant impulse to want to check her phone. He always wanted to get on her phone and, and check to see if she was still having the affair or, or he, he wanted to check to see if she might be having another affair. And he just, he constantly would check her phone to the point where she would get irritated with him. And it got to the point where her whole family confronted him saying, bro, you need to forgive and forget. What you're doing is wrong and it's distrust of your wife and and you know would kind of put the pressure on him and so he finally came to me and he's like what's wrong with me am i am i just really screwed up that i keep wanting to check her phone and and finally i'm like whoa 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 time out time out let's let's talk about the big process okay the nutshell version that i told him was forgive yes forget no actually forgetting is you that's dumb you don't want to forget that that's actually and here's why, okay? In order for healing to occur, you need verification and reassurance that wounding will not continue. Otherwise, you're never going to become healed. Actually, there, you're never going to be able to nurture trust until there is some sort of proven verification process over time where healing can occur, a proof of change. If you don't have proof of change it's like a wound filled with dirt and filled with glass and then you're expecting it to heal and then you're wondering why it's not healing well it's not sterilized it's not cleaned and so you never went through a process of cleaning sterilizing healing in order to actually get whole in the first place and so what oftentimes happens in life is people acquire these festering wounds wounds that are not healing, which over time, what, those festering wounds tend to irritate the people around you, right? And, and so a lot of times we'll tell people like that who are maybe irritating us with their wound, bro, forgive and forget. We'll, we'll, we'll say weird little cultural things like that when the real solution is we need to help them establish healthy boundaries, like, like get the sterility that allows healing to occur. Does that make sense? In other words, forgiving people is kind of hard when people continue to wound us, okay? And the reason I say this is because there's a lot of people who look like they're walking in unforgiveness, but they're actually not. What they're doing is, is they're crying out for healthier boundaries. And so once again, forgiving people is not overlooking boundaries, rather it's establishing boundaries. A part of the process of effective forgiveness means establishing boundaries so that forgiveness eventually will, will, will become a, a, a never-ending thing, which leads to the third misconception about forgiveness, and it's this, the false idea that forgiveness is overlooking justice instead of activating justice. Okay, a lot of people think that forgiveness is just, let's just call it even, even if it's not. Let's just overlook it, ignore it, or ignore justice. In fact, forgiveness requires justice still, okay? But it's, think of it this way. It's actually changing who brings about the justice, okay? So from a spiritual standpoint, forgiving someone is basically saying, God, I am not going to trust in human justice anymore. I'm going to trust in divine justice. So really what forgiveness does is it activates divine justice on your behalf, okay? Or, or if I could put it another way, forgiveness is not letting people off the hook. It's letting them off of your hook and putting them on God's hook. In other words, it's removing yourself as the conduit of justice. Now, the way that I like to describe it, when you forgive someone, and put, take them off your hook, put them on God's hook, it's kind of like a, have you ever seen a tag team wrestling match? Come on, somebody. It's like one of my guilty pleasures. I love tag team wrestling, pro wrestling. It's just like, well, it works where, you know, you have a partner, and of course, whenever you're getting beat up too much and you're feeling weak, you can just tag team your partner, and they jump into the, the, the ring, and they finish the match for you, right? And you can kind of tag team back and forth until 
until you pin the opponent, right? And of course, there's always that point in the match where the one guy got beat up, you know what I'm saying? He got too many pile drivers and now he's on the ground and now he's just like, he's like trying to get to his opponent. He's about to be pinned. He's about to, he's about to lose the match and all he's gonna do is reach out to his opponent. And of course, there's the healthy guy on the outside like, come on, and then their fingers are almost touching and then the guy grabs him and then he goes, and then the guy shakes his head like, I don't even know what that motion does, but it was just like raking a face and somehow it doesn't make any, you know, I never understood that one. But, you know, all of a sudden he's like, oh, and he can't reach. And now, his, his, you know, it's like, it's so dramatic. <laughs> like in any other professional sport, it's about efficiency, but in this, it's about style. Right? I mean, the guy could be winning the match. The guy who should be winning, he's flexing on the turnbuckle when the guy is like slowly crawling and you're like, oh, no. Like, and so really what, what, I'm out of shape. (sighs) (sighs) Forgiving people is like tag teaming your heavenly father. God is up in heaven saying, Loved one, I can fight this match for you. Just, just tag me. Activate divine justice. Get out of the ring. You're not even supposed to be fighting. Get out of the ring. Let me jump in and take care of this for you. In in, in other words, forgiveness is not letting someone off the hook. It's putting them on God's hook. And I, I share this because this is essentially what Jesus told Peter on the very night he was betrayed by their good friend Judas. Think about this. I love this. I'm still catching my breath. <laughs> wow. Okay. Remember, remember on the night he was betrayed by Judas, Judas shows up with the soldiers. I mean, the sense of betrayal Peter felt was so great. The sense of betrayal Jesus felt must have broke his heart. And yet, Peter pulls out his sword to defend Jesus. And he tries killing the high priest. And then Jesus doesn't rebuke Judas. Who did he rebuke? Peter, the guy defending him. And and he's like, Peter, you're you're trying to use carnal forms of influence. All you're going to do is perpetuate more pain, right? And so finally, um, you know, really Peter was just wanting justice, wasn't he? He was wanting justice. He was saying, this is unjust. I am going to do what I have to do in order to create justice. And Peter and Jesus rebukes him saying this. Get this. This will change things for you, okay? Matthew 26, 52. Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him. For all who draw the sword will die by the sword. In other words, all who live by carnal forms of influence, you're going to die by that same form of influence. It's like God didn't create you to live that way. And then he says this, Do you think I cannot call on my Father, and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? 12 legions historically equaled 72,000. Okay, so 72,000 angels. He's saying, don't you realize I've got 72,000 angels at the snap of my finger? I could just ask my Father in heaven and get that much power. Keep in mind, one angel in the Old Testament put to death 185,000 men. Okay, if one angel can do that, can you imagine 72,000 angels? Jesus is basically saying to Peter, Peter, do you realize how much spiritual power we have? Peter, please, would you stop flailing around like some powerless victim and understand how much power we have in this moment? Human power does not even stand a chance to God's power. Human justice cannot even hold a candle to God's divine justice. And yet right now, all you're doing is is you're going to die sooner than me. He was basically, Jesus knew he was going to die. He was actually walking into it on purpose in order to fulfill prophecy. And so he's, he's actually saying, Peter, you're actually obstructing the will of God here by trying to exact human justice. And you're just going to die sooner. It really just, you're, you're just hurting more people. You see, hear me out, church. That's what forgiveness does. It activates divine power. You're not letting people off the hook. You're putting them on God's. You're simply removing yourself as the conduit of justice. But why? Why does God want us out of the ring? Why does he want us to get out of the ring? Why does he want us to remove ourselves as the conduit of justice in a lot of circumstances? Well, number one, because God's a lot better at divine justice than we are. Is that not true? 
right? Let's be honest. When we're wounded, when we're hurt by someone, we don't want justice. We want revenge. And there's a huge difference between justice and revenge. And a lot of times when we're wounded, we cannot tell the difference. We want payback. We want something more. We want a pound of flesh. We want to make someone pay for it. In other words, we don't care if it's actually justice. We just want to feel better about ourselves. That's really what we're trying to do. And Jesus knows, oh, you're never going to feel better about yourself. It doesn't matter how much you know, flesh you can take out of someone. You're still going to be upset. If you live by the sword, you're going to die by the, die by the sword. If you live by pity and payback, you're going to die with pity and payback. The second reason why God wants us out of the ring is because when we're hijacked by, by the process of accusing other people, you know what it does? It makes us look a lot more like the devil whose name is what? The accuser of the brethren. Our behaviors betray which God we actually serve. We look like the devil who's constantly accusing people. That's what the devil does. You see, God wants us to look more like him, and he knows that we're never going to look more like him when we're constantly pointing the finger. Lastly, the third reason why God wants us out of this this human justice equation is because God wants us to be liberated to pursue both healing and the greater calling that he has on our lives. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that we should not pursue justice in the world. I think that the Lord calls us to pursue justice, but the way we do it is so critical because otherwise we will start transmitting pain rather than transforming it, okay? So hear me out here, okay? I'm not saying that we shouldn't advocate for justice, but the way that we do it matters. You see, God wants us to be liberated. If we're wounded, the last thing we should be doing is is running after justice. We should really just be getting healthy and focusing on the greater mission God has in our lives. Because let me tell you, every minute we spend worrying about other people's sin is a minute that we've lost from our true calling. And I'm going to develop this a lot more in the coming weeks. So that way it'll help you say, what do I need to do to lock my sight on this bigger thing that God is calling me to do? Uh, because a lot of us, I mean, we could have cured cancer in the same time that it took us. We were obsessing over so many people's issues and so many people's problems and spending so much time pointing the finger in so many directions. If we just took that energy and that time and put it on the mission of God, I'm just telling you, we could have probably done a million great exploits in the same period of time. That's why it's so important. God wants to liberate you to get back to those things that actually restore your soul. As kind of one last example of this, I I remember um, just a couple of years ago, I had my wallet stolen at a church event here. And, um, uh, you know, it's a little, it's it's weird to think about somebody (laughs) in your own church stealing your wallet. You know what I'm saying? Like, how weird is that? You know, like, they probably knew me, right? Chances are, right? And uh, and, uh, it was kind of odd uh, because in losing the money, I don't even care about losing the money. The wallet itself was a really, really fancy wallet that was given to me as a gift. And I know it sounds kind of dumb, but I was sentimentally attached to this wallet. And I was just like, I was like, ah, that wallet, it was a really nice one that I would have never purchased for myself. It was kind of a splurge that somebody gave me. And, and of course, on top of that, I just got my new driver's license. Oh, and then if I go get another one, then I'll get signed up for jury duty again. And then it's just like, ah, like I, I don't want to, like, oh, like, I'd ra- let's be honest. I would rather pay a thousand bucks than go to the DMV, right? But I, I was just like, I, and then on top of that, I had just gone through the whole, like, FBI interview to get my global entry card uh, for, you know, international travel. And that was also in my wallet. And I kept thinking about all the time it's going to take to try to get all these cards back again and then to make matters worse. Okay, literally get this. The person who stole them started charging all sorts of things at Walmart while I was preaching. And all these things were showing up on my iPad while I was preaching. Because my credit card kept notifying me, you just bought another thing at Walmart. I thought, what the heck? Well, like a wow. I mean, talk about wow. I mean, talk about distracting. Now, okay, in the past, in the past, I think I would have stewed over that person for years in anger. You know what I'm saying? Like, like the great hot dog snatcher. In the past, 
I would have allowed my thoughts to stay hijacked by that individual for a long time. The old Peter would have whined to a dozen people. You know what I'm saying? How was your day? Oh, you want to hear about my day? Let me tell you about, let me tell you about Walmart. Can you believe at Walmart they bought a dozen White Castle gift cards? I mean, come on, at least have some class. Get some gift cards to some classier places. Like, unbelievable. I would have whined about everything. You, oh, you think you had a bad day? Let me tell you about Monday, my wallet, my this, my that, my, you know. I, I, old Peter would have turned off all the lights and turned on country music. Here's the truth, okay? I've seen God's hand of justice so often over the years that when all this happened, I was almost kind of surprised by myself. Uh, uh, Like, instead of being upset, instead of being angry, um, so my wife asked me, like, how are you doing? She was kind of worried if I was, you know, all up in my head, you know, old Peter, is he there stewing and brooding over this person, just angry? She goes, how are you feeling about your wallet being stolen? And and I'm like, I'm like, Carolyn, you know, that I feel terrible for that person. Like, can you imagine what God is going to do to defend me in front of that person? I mean, that poor person is going to regret the day they stole from a child of God. You know, like I was going like, woo, God's got me. Like I take team dumb. God just jumped over the turnbuckle and he's like, bam, bam. I'm like, I feel sorry for that guy. Don't touch the Lord's anointed. You know, like, I don't know. I, some of you are like, maybe you're not more mature after all. But I, I just like, in my mind, I'm like, I'm surprised. I'm surprised. Like, I, I, maybe, maybe, but you know what it was is over the years of watching God take care of me, I'm not worried as much when people rip me off or when things like that happen. And, and it was almost like weird, like, am I growing? Am I, am I actually becoming more secure in my heavenly father? And of course, sure enough, the very next week, somebody sent me a letter. Hey, I, with my ID, with my driver's license. Hey, I live in White Bear Lake, and I found your driver's license sitting on the sidewalk, and I thought I'd send it to you. And I'm like, whoo, I don't have to go to the DMV. And then literally, the, 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 the same time, I had a pastor friend. He bought me this really, really, really fancy, expensive wallet as a gift. He's like... I was just listening to some of your messages. They so blessed me. I just thought, I just wanted to buy you a gift, and here it is. Like, he had no idea that I had just got my wallet stolen, he, but he buys me this fancy new wallet. I mean, I kept thinking, what are the odds? And then the very next day, I get another, another letter from someone saying, hey, I found your global entry card on the ground, but there's no address on it, so I Googled you. I found out that you're a pastor. And I just felt compelled to give you a bunch of money. And all this money fell out of the thing. And I was like, what the heck? Way more money than I had in my wallet, let me tell you. And I was just like, what? Like, what the heck? You see, I share all of that. And I think God was up in heaven saying, Peter, I got you. I got you. Boom. You know what I'm saying? God, God wants to defend you like that. Some of you, I'm telling you, God is saying, tag me. Tag me. Let me into this area of your life. And right now, this is, you don't want God in because you're afraid that God won't do a good job. You're afraid nobody can get justice like you can. But in reality, you're just actually becoming less and less filled with the Holy Spirit, less and less filled with his fruits, his love, his joy, his peace, his patience, his kindness. It's gone. And God's like, hey, I never called you to live that way. And I I share this because over the years I've come to believe that God's justice is so certain and so perfect that when I get hurt by someone, I don't spend a whole lot of time worrying about justice and restitution the same way I used to. And Because here's the deal. If you give it time, all of your adversaries will reap what they sow. Why? Because Galatians 6, 7, God cannot, cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Nobody gets away with sin. And once you understand that's a spiritual law of the universe, that, you know what, you're not going to worry about justice the same way. It's actually kind of an assumption. Justice will happen. It just takes a little time. And just as important, and it's important you understand this as well, no one can rob you of the things that God desires for you to have. Are you hearing me? No one can rob you of the, if God is intended you to have whatever, it doesn't matter if someone steals it from you, God will give you something even better. 
Like, you just have to trust him. Now, now, don't get me wrong. Sometimes God will take a good, sweet amount of time to work that out for your benefit. Sometimes it can be 10 years before all of a sudden things work out, and then you'll, it'll all make sense, okay? So there sometimes is a delay between promise and power. I will admit that, but trust me, God's justice and his restitution on your life is certain, and at some point in your life, the favor of God will be so clear that you're going to be like Joseph in Genesis 45, and I'm going to end with this, okay, where Joseph learns he does not have to pick up the sword. In fact, he can pick up a different weapon called forgiveness. That's what forgiveness is, is it's a weapon. And check this out, okay, Genesis 45, verse 8, so then he said to his brothers, I love this perspective, and this is something that I've had to really internalize over the years. He says this, it was not you who sent me here, brothers, but it was God. Whoa. Then he threw his arms around his brother Benjamin and wept, and Benjamin embraced him weeping, and he kissed all of his brothers and wept over them. And then a couple chapters later, you see the famous statement that Joseph makes Genesis 50, verse 20, what you intended to harm me, God intended for good. You see, he understood something about God and that God is always working things together for the good of those that love him that are called according to the pur his purpose. And listen, I'm not going to say that it will always make sense to you because it won't. There's a lot of things in my life that were, that were big setbacks, that were big pains in my life that I, I, to this day, I don't understand and that I might not understand until heaven, but Joseph understood something that God is always turning everything into something more beautiful if we could just stop and let God have creative license. You see, Joseph's forgiveness signaled literally the birth of an entire nation. If you study the narrative of the scriptures, that act of forgiveness literally gave birth to the nation that God intended Israel to be. That, that act of forgiveness that the very lineage of Christ poured down through that act of forgiveness. How poetic is that? And listen to me, loved ones. God's response to your circumstance will be no less powerful. But where does it start? It starts with a commitment just to lay your life down, to forgive, to lay down the sword, to activate divine justice. And so here's how I want to end today. Just wherever you're at, would you just close your eyes, bow your head, and just... Think about the person you need to forgive. Who's that person whose sins you feel compelled to rehearse? Who's the, the, the person, you, the institution you tend to rant about the most? I just, I want you to imagine yourself handing that over to God right now and saying, God, I trust you. God, I trust you. And, and, and even as I pray this, Father, I just... I, I just sense that the pain that people have been carrying, it's so heavy. And yet you want to lift those burdens so that we can experience joy, peace, and life. And I just pray that you would take these burdens that you never designed us to carry. Just lift them off our shoulders that we may be filled with the life that you've called us to live. And, and maybe, church, as I'm praying this prayer, you're here and you've never given your life over to Christ before. And, and I, I just believe that God would actually wants you to imagine you giving yourself over to him in this moment. If you've never given your life to Christ, just repeat this simple little prayer after me, all of us. Just everybody join in on this repeat after me prayer as we pray this together. Say this, say, dear Jesus, forgive me, renew me, and lead me starting today and for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you mean that prayer just between you and God, say, I mean that prayer. Thank you, Jesus, for your life. <sighs> you guys feeling his joy yet? I'm telling you, he's going to lift those burdens. With all that said, we're going to have our campus pastors come on up and tell us where we're going to go next. I love you guys. We'll see you next week.